Hello. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, and also, like on behalf of Cloudflare, welcome. This is our office. Um, so we really like to host these meetups. We've been using ClickHouse for a long time, so it's great to support it. Um, yeah, I'm James. I've been at Cloudflare for two years now um, on our ClickHouse team that whole time. If you think anything I have to say is interesting, we do have an open role, so you can take a little look at that. Um, but yeah, as you saw on the title there, I'm going to be talking about how we have been managing dictionaries here um, at Cloudflare. I'll talk about some of the history of it, some of the problems that we were running into and how we solved those issues, and then at the end I'll talk about maybe some things that we would still like to improve in the future. Um, yeah, so on our ClickHouse team for two years, I made one teeny tiny upstream contribution, um, which was reverted. <laughs> but uh, you know what? My name's in the Git history, so you know, kind of counts. Um, but yeah, history. ClickHouse was open sourced in 2016, and we were running it in production like by the end of that year. So we've been long-term users. Um, since then, we've scaled up sort of exponentially. This year, we actually exceeded a thousand active replicas. Um, that's processing hundreds of millions of inserted rows. Uh, every second, which actually corresponds to quite a significantly larger number of events because we've been using a lot of sampling. Um, we have a few different data sets, for example, information about HTTP requests, DNS lookups, and uh, you can actually build on top of our data pipeline yourselves using Worker's Analytics Engine, which will just get you everything out of the box, all that sampling stuff. Um, you just push data and query it, and it's great. Um, so I'm aware this is a ClickHouse meetup. Many of you probably know what dictionaries are, but I'll just cover briefly. Um, dictionaries allow us to do key value lookups in our queries. Typically, we're storing the data in memory, which allows us to do sort of join type queries more efficiently than you would otherwise be able to do in ClickHouse. Um, the data is coming from various external systems. You can configure these in a ton of different ways, um, which is like a blessing and a curse because you can achieve a lot, but also you sort of have to understand all the options that are available. Um, so one example would be, you know, we have a node dictionary, which we use to look up information about different machines. So if you wanted to know what hardware type was a server using when it served an HTTP request, you could use it to solve that. Um, that's the same slide again, but now with a reference to a blog post by Dale um, from last year, which kind of covers dictionaries a bit more in depth. It's really good. Um, at Cloudflare, we have 184 dictionaries deployed in various places. Um, I've traced out over the last few years how we grew over time. Uh, and the point I really want to emphasize is that those dictionaries are contributed by engineers all across Cloudflare. We on the ClickHouse team basically never make dictionaries. It's other teams that make them, and we just look after them. Um, and yeah, when I think about like the data in these dictionaries, it kind of breaks down into static data and dynamic data. So the static data is typically stored in Git. We then load it up into just a static file on the file system. ClickHouse reads from that. It's pretty simple. The other ones are dynamic, and we use those for the larger data sets that change quite frequently. Um, these can be much, much larger. They can have millions of entries, and the memory usage correspondingly it can be much, much higher. Um, these external sources are, again, owned by other teams, um, sometimes even other companies. So it's sort of beyond our visibility as a ClickHouse team to see what those are doing. Um, the dictionaries are also used to solve a variety of uh, problems. So for example, some Cloudflare products use uh, queries that like looking at real-time analytics, they need to use dictionaries in those queries. Likewise, we have a GraphQL API that customers can use to view their own analytics data. Um, so in both those cases, if you had an issue with the dictionary, then those things will break, and that's really bad. Likewise, the insert path sometimes depends on dictionaries. We sort of discourage that for the same reason where <laughs> if the dictionary has a problem, your data pipeline just goes offline, so that's bad. Slightly less serious ones, we've got like Grafana dashboards and analysts can issue queries, but if the dictionary breaks there, it sucks, but like we're not in trouble immediately. <laughs> um, 
And then at the bottom of the list, in terms of importance, we have just the tech debt, the stuff that nobody has used for years, but it exists because no one got rid of it either. Um, so from there, I'm just going to move on quickly to talk about some of the problems that we had with this setup, some of the solutions we came to. Um, the primary sort of thing that led us to be looking at dictionaries was the memory usage. Um, this graph on the right-hand side is the sum of memory used by all of our dictionaries on all of our replicas. Um, the unit is terabytes, so 15 terabytes of memory just holding dictionary data, which is a lot because it means you can't use that data to store other stuff like the page cache or like primary key related stuff. Um, our largest dictionary at the time was exceeding 20 gigs of memory. And the one thing that we noticed uh, across the board with all our dictionaries, the big ones, was they were using this hashed layout. Um, the way it works is you have one hash map per attribute in your dictionary, um, which makes for pretty efficient lookups, but it does mean you're duplicating the memory overhead of the, uh, of the hash map for every attribute in the dictionary. The solution for this problem, thankfully, you can see memory usage dropped over time, even though we actually have more replicas online. That's a one year period. Um, it was an in, in place solution, just replace the layout with hashed arrays. Um, this basically works by using one array per attribute, and then you just have a single hash map, which tells you what index you need to use to look up in that array. So you can see, again, this was that massive dictionary using 25 gigs or almost 25 gigs at its peak. After we made the change, it drops down to five or six gigs. But it's still growing, so maybe one day we'll have to think some more. Um, yeah, I would recommend everyone should just try this. In theory, there is an extra layer of pointer dereferencing, but we never saw any real impact from this change, so I, I would suggest to give it a try if you're using the hashed layout. Um, the next three problems didn't have quite as simple of a solution, so I'll talk about each of them together and then the solution afterwards. Um, but again, going back to this idea that we have dependencies on external systems that we don't own, we don't have control of, we often don't really have much visibility over how they work. It might just be like, there's an HTTP API that we're calling and maybe it returns data. Um, so, in the best case scenario, when these upstream systems fail, ClickHouse can keep the dictionary data stale in memory. Um, the data you know, might slowly become incorrect, but it's still better than not having data at all, going back to those use cases where if the dictionary is gone, you have problems. Um, but that stale data will not be there if the ClickHouse replica restarts. You just lose it. And again, those use cases like product, GraphQL, they're just going to break. Um, the next issue actually is kind of the same thing, but sometimes that upstream system can struggle because of ClickHouse. Um, you know, again, we have a thousand replicas, several hundred of them might load the same dictionary, which means they're all going to the same source, issuing the same lookups to get the exact same data. And about a year ago, we were having quite a few conversations with our Postgres team internally, who were not happy about um, all of these connections. You can see on the right, this top graph showing we had like over a thousand connections to Postgres open all the time, huge amount of egress bandwidth on the bottom graph. Um, and when you think about it, it is very, very silly to have all these uh, replicas connecting to the same external system, running the exact same query, fully expecting to get the exact same result back. Um, in some cases you can implement caching, but it's sort of case by case and it takes quite a bit of engineering time to set that sort of thing up. So it's not ideal. Um, another problem that we came up with was that with dictionaries, as I said, other teams are making them and kind of just drop kicking them onto our machines. So like executable dictionaries will just run a script. Uh, it could be written in like Python or Bash or whatever. Um, and if that script you know, is written by another team, we don't really have a deep knowledge over how it works or what its dependencies are. So that means that every change you want to make to your environment will potentially just break the script. Um, and there's an embarrassing example here where we were upgrading to Debian uh, Bullseye, which removes Python 2, three months ago. Um, Python 2 was end of life three years ago, so whatever, no big deal, right? But it was a big deal. We had some dictionaries that broke. Um, 
And it turns out those dictionaries were used by some of our Cloudflare's products, which um, caused some consternation. We should have potentially noticed this, but there was a, the final problem I want to talk about, which is that sometimes, very occasionally, ClickHouse has bugs. Um, the one I'm highlighting here is this top one on this table, um, where executable dictionaries reported themselves as having been successfully loaded, but in fact, they did not. Um, so with this Python issue, um, the script obviously failed because Python did not exist. But ClickHouse was happily reporting that the dictionary was loaded and that everything was fine, which sort of increased the delay between when things broke and when we knew they had broken. Um, as you can see, though, there are pull requests. When these things happen, we do try our best to understand the problem, make a fix, submit it upstream. It simplifies our life when we're close to upstream. And it does also obviously benefit everyone else too. So that's great. Um, but yeah, again, emphasizing bugs are rare. So this is not a super common issue. But uh, I believe now I can talk to you about how we solved some of these problems. Um, it's a project I've been working on internally called ClickHouse Dictionary Dumper. Um, and the high level idea is to separate the production of data from the consumption. So we produce data in cron jobs and Kubernetes. I call these dumpers. The basic steps are you dump the data, you have some validation tests uh, which run in an ephemeral ClickHouse container, and then if everything's good, you bundle it up and push it into object storage. Asynchronously, um, on each ClickHouse replica, we have a timer which is just pulling the dictionary bundle out of object storage and extracting it onto disk. Uh, and what this means is that every ClickHouse replica now is just loading dictionaries using the file source and so there's zero sort of external traffic. It's all just loading the dictionaries off disk. Um, so how does this solve, let's say, the issue of upstream failures? Well, <coughs> if the upstream fails, our dumper is obviously going to fail. It can't produce the data. The data is not going to validate successfully, which means there's no new da data being pushed into object storage. But that's OK, because the replicas have a stale copy of data on disk. So even if the replica is restarted, it's just going to pull that data off the disk and everything is cool. Um, in the same vein, with the upstream potentially becoming overloaded, this is not something that can happen because of ClickHouse now, because we only have one pod in Kubernetes that's going to talk to that upstream system. Um, potentially, we could overload the object storage because all the replicas talk to it, but it's a, a very thoroughly battle-tested system at Cloudflare, at least. So it's designed to run these kind of scales. And if it ever did have an issue, again, the data's on disk. So we're good to go. Um, regarding this issue where we were sort of looking after stuff that our team didn't fully understand, it's not a problem anymore. Because the dumper is using an image that these teams will just provide to us. So. Being a Docker image, they get to manage their own dependencies. They can choose what to depend on, when they want to update it. And if they make an update to it that breaks their dependencies, it doesn't really matter because, again, we have that stale copy of the data on disk. And they can just fix it in their own time. Uh, so yeah, there's a very clear division of ownership now where teams own the dumping of the data and the validation. And then we own the bundling of the data and everything that runs on the individual machines. Um, again, bugs are rare, but the way we solve this is that because we're sort of using the file source, we're exercising a much smaller number of code paths. We're never going to run into issues with ODBC bridge. We're never going to have issues with executable files um, because everything's just a file source loading static files off disk. Um, you could argue some of the bugs might just get moved elsewhere in this pipeline, but um, for us, we're mostly concerned about keeping ClickHouse online. I don't really care about someone's pod in Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, those are the problems that we've sort of been dealing with so far. Um, I'll just talk briefly some more ideas that we still have. Um, I mentioned we have these dictionaries that just grow in memory. They're unbounded. That's quite a scary concept. Um, but there's definitely some low-hanging low fruit here. Um, I think some sort of in-memory compression for dictionaries seems like a, a very clearly good idea to me, because I've noticed several of our large dictionaries have attributes that are just like a, a column of almost all zeros, for example, and like there's no compression there. So 
if we could compress this or maybe have the sort of codec support from merge trees somehow added to dictionaries, um, we could save a lot more memory still. There is also the potential to serve data from like some store on disk or over the network. We did experiment with this a little bit, but kind of came to the conclusion that it's not ideal because um, what we observe is that when queries are being issued to the dictionaries, it's quite a spiky workload where you can just go from like zero lookups to millions of lookups every second. Um, so for that type of query pattern, you really just want to have the data all in memory. Another idea of sorts is that um, sometimes dictionaries just aren't necessary. Here I've got a, an example of one of our dictionaries which is recording the direction of network traffic. I don't know what unknown could, could measure there, but in, out, unknown, do we need a dictionary? Maybe. Um, Clickhouse in recent years has had some stuff like low cardinality string which could solve some issues instead of using a dictionary, just insert the data directly. Um, likewise, we have enum columns which could potentially be used for this scenario. Um, we also see some dictionaries that have attributes that nobody really uses very much, so dropping those would help. Um, I think one thing that would be great is if we had just had more metrics that we could use to understand the use patterns of some of these dictionaries. Um, yeah, the final idea I just want to run over is um, some of these static files aren't actually that static. Um, they change semi-regularly, and that means an engineer has to go in every time and make a pull request. And most of the time, that's duplicating information that exists somewhere else. So those scenarios, you could have a dynamic dictionary that does some sort of code generation. It might not have been easy in the old way, where we had executable source dictionaries, but with the dictionary dumper, where you can just set up any Docker image to do whatever you want to, um, it's a bit more straightforward. So yeah, that's, um, that's my talk. Thank you.